Good evening and uh, welcome. It's, uh, it's really great uh, that to see there's so much uh, interest in the broader Brown uh, community in this uh, very important uh, topic. My name is Richard Locke. I'm a professor of political science and international and public affairs at Brown and I serve as uh, provost. And I am thrilled to be here tonight to be able to host this really exciting uh, event. I'm really excited to be able to moderate this discussion between two of Brown's top academic leaders, Professor Tony Bokes, who serves as the director of the Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice, and Professor Tricia Rose, who serves as the director for the uh, Center for the Study of Race and Ethnicity in America. They are two of the top scholars in their fields. They are excellent colleagues and wonderful friends. And I'm also very excited to be able to share uh, this event with over 1,500 alumni, parents, students, and friends who have registered for, for this event from around the world, including people from our most recent graduates to people who uh, graduated uh, from the what we call the greatest uh, generation. So uh, let me uh, talk to you a little bit about the two centers. Uh, and then about uh, the wonderful uh, speakers that we have tonight, and then a bit about how we're gonna structure uh, this evening. So let me uh, start with the Center for the Study of Race and Ethnicity uh, in America. This was established in 1986 as one of the nation's earliest academic centers dedicated to research, scholarship, and academic exchanges on issues of race and ethnicity in this country. The center at Brown today is a vibrant intellectual home uh, with a wide network of faculty, postdoctoral fellows, graduate students, undergraduates, visitors who are all coming together to actually engage in a host of activities. Some of them are exhibits, some of them are lecture series, informal get togethers, dissertation uh, workshops doing uh, incredibly exciting and cutting edge research on what I see as one of the most pressing, if not the most pressing issue of our times, which is the study of race and ethnicity in this country and how to use that study to combat uh, racism. The Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice was officially established in 2013, but I think many of you on this call will remember that it traces its origins to the Steering Committee on Slavery and Justice, which was appointed by, Professor, uh, by President Ruth Simmons in 2003 and delivered its final report in 2006. And Professor Bowes was on that steering committee. Now that final report recommended among various things that the university create a center that would focus on research and teaching on issues related to slavery and other forms of historic and contemporary injustice, as well as struggles against them. And the center has done exactly that and has emerged as not only one of the country's leading centers in this field, but actually one of the world's leading center uh, in this field and collaborating with a network of other centers, museums, institutes, uh, and universities doing this very, very important work. Um, among the many exhibits and projects, uh, visitors, et cetera, that take place at the center is also this wonderful walking tour uh, uh, of uh, the slavery and its legacy um, that, takes, that takes place here in Providence. And next time you are in Providence, I highly recommend this uh, uh, to you. Uh, we will uh, chat out, the uh, if you haven't already received them, uh, the links to both of these centers. Um, I can't really do justice to the wealth of activity uh, uh, that's taking place uh, at both of them. As I said, um, both of these centers have emerged as leading centers of intellectual activity, not just at Brown, but in the country. And they are actually uh, setting the path, uh, intellectual path, policy path, uh, action-oriented uh, path uh, uh, in this country for addressing these important issues, which, as I said, are among the most important uh, of our times. So now let me tell you a little bit about our speakers. Um, uh, Tricia Rose currently serves as the Chancellor's Professor of Africana Studies 
uh, as well as the Associate Dean of the Faculty for Special Initiatives, and of course, as the Director for the Center for the Study of Race and Ethnicity in America. She specializes in 20th century African American culture and politics, social thought, popular culture, and gender issues. She has, uh, she's an incredibly prolific uh, author, numerous books, and many, many different articles. Among her most well-known are Black Noise, Rap Music and Black Culture in Contemporary America, Longing to Tell, Black Women Talk About Sexuality and Intimacy, and uh, more recently, The Hip Hop Wars, what we talk about when we talk about hip hop and why it matters. She is currently working on a very, very important book on systemic racism in America. Tony Bo Bo Bokes is the Asa Messer Professor of Humanities and Critical Theory, a professor of Africana Studies, and the director, of course, of the Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice. He is also a faculty fellow at the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs. Tony is a major figure in the field of Africana intellectual history and political theory, and one of the leading intellectual historians of the Caribbean. Uh, Professor Bogues is the author of four books and four edited volumes and has written numerous articles in the fields of intellectual history, political thought, literary and cultural studies, as well as Caribbean and African art. So um, it's really a, a pleasure to be able to uh, convene these two wonderful colleagues and scholars of Brown and engage in a wonderful conversation uh, with them. The way that we're going to proceed is start with a presentation from Professor Bogues, then that will be followed uh, with a presentation, brief presentation uh, from uh, Professor Rose, and then uh, we'll open it up to a question and answer discussion. I'm gonna, many of you have already sent in questions prior to the event as part of the registration. So I'm gonna kick off our Q&A session by reading some of those, but then we will uh, be collecting other uh, questions through the chat and I'll be reading those. So with that, let me turn to Professor Bowes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Provost Law. Uh, first, I wanna begin by uh, thanking uh, Mary Ward and her team for putting together this uh, program, as well as to thank uh, Provost Locke, who, whose advocacy um, resulted in the program. And then, and also thank my colleague, Professor Rose, uh, for agreeing to join, um, join us, join the program so that we can have a conversation. I wanna make uh, three points. They are primarily uh, historical uh, points. And because they're historical points, uh, they have uh, critical consequences for our contemporary world. And uh, therefore, simultaneously, they trouble how we think about the relationship between history and the present, where we think about history as only something in the past, rather than seeing history as part of a living presence of how the past is a presence within the present, acting as an element of structuration within our time. So what are the three points? The first one is this, racial slavery and European colonialism made the modern world. It did so in many ways, but I want to isolate a few. The first is that it structured and made the modern world to the business of economics, that there is, was no, bis, no uh, issue or no matter and processes of accumulation that occurred in the making of the modern world from the 1500s onwards without the, that of black labor. The texts of people like Eric Williams, 1944, to recent texts of people like Walter Johnson and Stephen Brackett's and the Cotton, and the Cotton Kingdom it illustrates how black labor in the Americas was central to the processes of accumulation, to the creation of economic wealth in the in that shapes the modern world. And so, and the, but this is not something that is fairly that is new, actually. Although the historiography today seems to want to make it new, from 1935, people like W. B. Du Bois in his book on Black Reconstruction 
made this point, point about the ways in which black labor, specifically speaking about America, was central to the process of capital and economic accumulation. All of this has deep implications. Firstly, that one, you can't think about the history of capitalism or economic system without not thinking about what some colleagues have called racial capitalism. But sometimes more important, I think, is that you cannot think about the contemporary configuration of economics and of economic life without not thinking about the relationship between class, race, and, and gender, obviously, and the ways in which poverty and the questions of inequality mark economic and social life. And therefore that we need to trace back these marks to the historical consequences of racial slavery. So that's my first point, how racial slavery and European colonialism shape the modern world and continue to structure the world that we live in today. My second point is this, that, act, that racism, we are not talking now specifically of anti-Black racism, we're just saying racism generally. Racism was remade by racial slavery into anti-Black racism. And what do I mean here? We now have the historical evidence that there are racial orders in the Western world, in the Mediterranean, in Iberia, in parts of Northern Africa. And that these, race, these racial orders also included anti-Semitism. But the racial, these racial orders were also uh, constructed around issues of religion, around issues of geographical difference, a certain kind of othering. But there are two things about these racial orders. First, they were not in perpetuity. In other words, the social structures in these societies were fluid so that people could move in and out of a certain kind of position that was initially made determined by race. And secondly, if a person was enslaved in, in, in this, this kind of society, he or she did not have, they were not, was not enslaved in perpetuity. And it means also that his or her progeny could, did not necessarily be slaves. What racial slavery did, and Atlantic slave trade, was that it transformed these racial orders from just being racial orders that were based either on religion or difference, a kind of othering into anti-blackness. And by transforming racial orders into blackness, what it did was the following. Firstly, it fixed upon black people this position of inferiority and enslavement. So that really what then happened is that you became the black man to be a slave, the slave enslavement that you were black. Secondly, it also made the business of slavery and uh, in, uh, in, uh, one that was in perpetuity. Which means that what then happened is that your offspring was always was always a slave, and then thirdly, it created um, forms of white supremacy, and then this I think becomes really very distinctive, because what is important is that the creation of anti-black racism, not now just race, but an anti-black racial order, is deeply connected to a global order. So that Colum the Colombian voyages of 1492, therefore, inaugurated a certain kind of world, inaugurated a world in which anti-blackness became the order, the governing, one of the governing orders of the day. What I'd also meant in the history of thought is that say, things like natural history, when the processes of what some people have called the godding of the, and the godding, the processes of religion, began to take place and the invention of the human as a figure begins to emerge in thought is that this invention of the figure emerges in a context of racial slavery and colonialism. And so in that particular context, the black was not human and indigenous people were seen as, as natural man in a particular ladder of civilization of who was civilized and who could not be civilized. This business, therefore, of the art of black racism thus did something else. It made, it made black people disposable. 
and created various human classificator schemes, which today still govern our, our, our thought and govern, quite frankly, um, subliminal sometimes the ways we think about human, human beings. All this means is that anti-Blackness is not just simply an ideology, is not simply a cultural form, formation of, of significance, is not just about the sociological form, that it is quite frankly, a kind of a, a philosophical anthropological frame for who is human and for who is not human. My third point, to confront this particular history of racial slavery is to confront the foundations of anti-Black racism and to confront white supremacy. But to do this, it is also, also means that we have to confront a series of foundational questions about America itself. For, for us, therefore, at the center, both our scholarly research as well as our public humanities work is really about finding ways creating platforms of critical interventions into the historical narratives, which undergird our imaginers of our history and of who we are as, as, as Americans. What we will I hope to do is to, by, on, by puncturing these historical narratives, is to make a difference, to make a difference by creating critical scholarship that actually will make a difference. That's the heart of what we try to do at the center. And therefore for us, the question of history is not now a history of the past, but it's thinking about how in fact the present itself carries within it forms of history that we need to begin to tackle and to confront if we want to transform the American society into something else. Thanks very much for listening to me. And I now turn over to my uh, colleague, Professor Rose. Fantastic, Tony. Thank you very much. It's good to see you. And uh, that's a, a wonderful sort of foundational um, presentation about um, the question of not only the past itself, but the past in the present and our understanding and willingness to, to confront it in a variety of ways and, and make the past, in a sense, different based on our present choices. Um, I'm really delighted to be here. I'm incredibly excited to see so many of you join this uh, first uh, event of its kind. And I wanna thank Mary and the entire Office of Alumni Relations, also Advancement who've been part of this event. And of course, uh, my dear colleague and provost Rick Locke, who's been a great supporter of both of our centers and has worked tirelessly to, uh, to really dramatically improve and, and complexify our understanding of these issues on campus in terms of policy and scholarship. Um, Center for the Study of Race and Ethnicity, as Professor Locke mentioned, um, begins in 1986 and it evolves over time in a variety of directions. Um, over the past decade, uh, I have worked uh, to do a number of things uh, in, in, the, in the recent years uh, to bring it to the center of sort of intellectual focus on campus. One is to really create a hub for intellectual engagement on race in America. And the other is to provide public events um, and invite scholars who are, who are experts, but who are also accessible and who address issues from the perspective and uh, from the location that people are currently engaged in. So we use the present moment or the recent past or relatively contemporary framings as a way into the history and also as a way into the present. Um, it's, um, it's been uh, quite a journey along the way. And, and what I've discovered that I think is sort of at the heart of why this approach is so important is that we have been unbelievably uh, capable as a nation of living in a relatively uh, profound state of denial about the significance of race in America. You know, we've been studying these issues for decades. I'm sure between Tony and myself, there's, you know, I don't know, an entire lifetime of study that's gone on. And one of the things that really uh, strikes me uh, over the years is how powerful the myth-making is regarding the end of the significance of race. So you have multiple generations of the declining significance of race, the end of racial inequality uh, in our narrative, in our scholarship, in our public politics. 
And um, those myths, you know, that we live in a colorblind society, that we've leveled the playing field when it comes to race in America, um, that, um, you know, we've been successful and we're in a sort of post-racial society um, are really powerful uh, conceptions of how we function as, as a society. And they are very politically significant in that they shape the outcomes and choices and also our ability to see information as it is in front of us. There's a wealth wealth of information, not only in the form of data, but in a variety of formats that reveal that, you know, sure, a tremendous amount of progress has been made and there are amazing things about the United States that are worth uh, not only praising but expanding. But the question of racial inequity, the question of racial hierarchy, the ways in which particularly groups that have been colonized by the US, in this case, people of African descent, indigenous people, uh, Asian Americans in some circumstances, and also Latinx, uh, particularly Chicanos, but Latinx people in general, are incredibly important to understand uh, the history of the country as a whole. It's not a marginal one piece of the puzzle. It's in fact at the heart of, of what we what we should just call US sort of culture, history and practice. So by thinking about what we've been doing the last 40 or 50 years, one of the things we try to really focus on is just the, the power of these myths to obscure and then to reveal how um, the reality itself is functioning and then to invite a wide range of disciplines, scholars, students, graduate students, um, to really in, to engage with those questions in, in an interdisciplinary way. Um, one of the implicit uh, uh, sort of subtexts of the role of a center like CSREA, and I would dare say also of CSSJ, is that this kind of work, no matter how important it is in among individual scholars, has not been at the center of higher educational research uh, it, on its own, right? It's been occasionally prioritized during crisis moments, um, but it hasn't been understood as significant to most disciplines. It hasn't been at the heart of most of the disciplines. And when those issues come up, they're sort of relegated to a sort of temporary engagement, right? The, the notion of studying race has to be argued for over and over and over again. What centers do is allow us to hold the examination of race constant in the sense that everyone's trying to grapple with this critical issue from different disciplines, school of public health and, and epidemiology, uh, history, sociology, political science, uh, modern media uh, and modern culture and media studies, um, so on and so forth. Um, what that means is we're able to bring a wide range of people together who, who are, are interested in, in an interdisciplinary analysis of the, of, the, of the questions of race. And in so doing, we're able to catapult the conversation much more quickly. Um, and, and so it's been a, a profound, I think, uh, impact that we've been able to have for those reasons. Um, you know, we're at a moment in this country where we yet again can see how effective racial polarization is for political development and advancement and power grabs that you can literally create a complete crisis out of nothing. I think of the critical race theory of crisis or as someone in the chat was asking about 1619, that these things become you know, radically extreme in people's consciousness because of some people's agendas, but the curriculum itself has never really lived up to those fantasies. And so we use race consistently and very effectively, differently over time, but consistently and effectively to produce a set of myths and reproduce a set of hierarchies. And so the work we try to do is to bring everyone together to really challenge that practice and process and educate ourselves and each other about what how important race is. And, and so, and as I said, for many, many years, we there, it's almost impossible for me to imagine a peaceful, just, multiracial democracy without an educated, open, critically engaged uh, populace on the question of race. So we think what, what the center of, of what we do is at the center of the, of the future of the country, if not more than the country itself. So thank you very much. I'll stop there and look forward to further conversation on many things. Thank you again. 
Great. Uh, thank you, uh, both Tricia and Tony, for those really, really terrific uh, presentations. Uh, we have a ton of questions that have been uh, coming in. So some of them, I think, are related to um, both of you. Some of them are to your uh, distinctive uh, centers. Uh, and I, I'm just going to sort of alternate um, uh, across these questions. So let me start with one that came in from uh, Charles C., um, who graduated in 2001. Uh, and the question was, I note that the word study is in the title of both centers. How can study become action for change, for truth and reconciliation? So who wants to start? Tony, you go ahead. You're muted. Yeah, thanks for that question, uh, Provost, and thanks for the uh, question from the questioner. I mean, I think there is somehow in our minds, we have split the question of study from action. That they, on the one hand, there's action over here, and then the other hand, there's study over here. So it's as if almost on the one hand, there is the intellectual and ideas on this side of the room, and then on the other hand, are activists and people who try to make change. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a kind of false dichotomy. Um, and that what is really very important is really something that is very simple, which is that you really don't act to change something, particularly an aspect of human society, if you do not study and know about it. That it, it is, is, you know, it, you, you can't change um, the, the, the way in which uh, uh, human behaviors have operated for hundreds of years, uh, the way structures of a society have uh, operated, if you do not study and understand those structures. And therefore, I begin to understand what levers you can push, begin to understand who can you make alliances with, or how will those alliances, maybe some alliances may be temporary, some may be permanent. What kind of solid, who is you want to bring, you want to develop and create solidarities with? And so that one of the things that we find that is important is that at the center is that the study of the of racial of anti-black racism, of racial slavery becomes very, very important as a form of almost as a form of action itself. It is why, in fact, that there is a um, some people have manufactured a crisis in this country in the education system around the so-called study of critical theory, because what they are seeing is that not, is that they, you have you know have a possibility of people beginning to think about a different history of the country, and the, the thinking about the different history of the country also actually opens the possibilities for you to begin to think differently about what the present and the future might look like. And so that, the, you know, there is a, you know, there's a way in which history and the narratives of history and so on, um, and the narratives about why structures are what, are, are, are what they are, um, is really a part of a set of dominant ideas in a society. You have to study them, you have to develop new ideas, you have to have different alternative ideas, and those ideas themselves become one foundation or one platform for you to begin to act. So I don't see study as separate at all from action. I think they are, this is really very, it's, the process is integral. Yeah, yeah, I agree entirely with that, um, but I wanna focus on that question from a slightly different perspective which is that um, the word study um, should be in most of the spaces on a campus, right? We are a higher educational institution. Our job is to study. So that's first of all. But secondly, it's very important for a context of race to, to use the word study because it's one of the subjects about which people think their personal opinion and their experience is adequate to explain the situation in the world. Um, very few of us would make a claim that without being a mathematician that we could understand, you know, elaborate circumstances related to math, you know, mathematics, right? I have no capacity to make any claims about physics. I have no capacity to make any claims about any number of disciplines and, and forms of knowledge, but about race. And there are other categories that fit this description. Gender would be another one. People feel very confident saying, well, you know, I don't see color or, 
you know, uh, race doesn't affect me or whatever the story is, because we come to this particular subject with um, a, a, a mostly unconscious form of ideological development that hasn't been critically engaged with. So study is always important, but it's especially important for those kinds of spaces where we have what one might call blind spots, learned, learned blind spots. That's great. Uh, thank you. A related question that I, I want to pose to both of you as well uh, came in from Mark. Uh, and it said, how do you envision everyday folk uh, doing this work, not just academics, mm -hmm. having access to the resources of both of your centers? Maybe um, we'll start with Tricia and then ask Tony, because I think both of you yeah. are so engaged uh, with right. the communities. And I think it's important for our audience to know about that. Yeah, and that's a wonderful question. Um, there are a number of things we try to do. Um, I, I tried to emphasize this in my opening comments about having a profound investment in accessible scholarship. I don't believe that most knowledge has to be framed so obscurely that everyday people who have other jobs beside reading for a living uh, can't understand what's going on. I, I know some of the most brilliant people I know and study and admire can speak in very plain speech it may take a while for it to be articulated because of the you know, linearity of that process, but it's nonetheless accessible. So one of the things we do in our commitment is that while we get we bring specialists to the campus and we focus on this issue, I prioritize bringing people who can speak what I would call across spaces. They're not speaking very specialized language because I think that is exclusionary fundamentally and makes it harder for everyday people to, um, to engage. Um, the other thing we do is try to focus on contemporary issues, issues that people are engaged with. And the third thing we do is we make all of our, our programs, or 98% of them, available via video uh, you know, after the fact. They're on our website. You go to our website at Brown, CSREA, it's backslash brown, uh, back race backslash brown.edu. You will find hundreds and hundreds of videos on of, of almost 100% of our events. This is a profound catalog of amazing people who come over the years. Uh, people you may know, people you may not, but that is a very important public resource that, I, that I've been very committed to making sure uh, is part of our mission and vision. Yeah, uh, thank you. One of the things that the CSAJ does is that we begin from the position that the uh, history that we are engaged with about racial slavery and its consequences in America is not simply an academic matter. It is a matter that for the country. And indeed, some of us would argue for the world. And if it is, then the question that faces us is, what, how do you then proceed? What kind of method do you develop to engage people? And so one of the ways we think about the center doing this is that we think about the center as what we call a research slash public humanities center. And the public humanities for us becomes, has two aspects to it. We have been, been, when we became the center, one of the things we did was that we, we did an investigation as to where is it that people learn their history most in this country. And we found that they did not learn it most from us who write historic books. We found it that they found out that they learned it most in museums. And so we thought, okay, if we are going to intervene in the historical narrative to try and change it, then one of the things we have to do is to work with museums that to, to change their narratives and to help them create different kind of narratives um, that will transform how we think about America and the question of um, history of race and racial slavery in this country. And so public humanities projects are really very important. They have two aspects to it. They have one, an art, art aspect to it. And so we work with various museums around the world um, to, to, uh, you know, to make sure that whatever narrative that they are doing about slavery also tells a certain story from the perspective of the enslaved, not just an institutional narrative. Um, you know, and I would say you know, we are, are co-curating with the National African American Museum of History and Culture out of the Smithsonian, a large exhibition about slavery and the making of the world, which will be 
um, shown first in DC in September 24, and then traveled the world to Brazil, South Africa, Dakar, the Caribbean, Belgium, uh, and London, and, and, and Liverpool. And, and that to us is one way of making accessible um, the, the, the history and the story. But there's also something else that is important to us. We, in doing that, we began to realize if you're telling the story from the point of view of the enslaved, that you also need to develop another set of archives. So one of the things that we have been doing um, is working with the library is that we are developing what I would call without any kind of immodesty, quite frankly, the best archive in the world of oral histories of people who were enslaved or who have memories of being enslaved, primarily women. And that, you know, I just had a meeting today with my colleagues from uh, Brazil who are doing this and they, and they work with the museum of the National Historical Museum as well as the Museum of Samba. And one of the things that came out in that discussion today as they are planning their work is not just the uh, talking about the lives of the enslaved, but think they were thinking about how music actually became a vehicle in Brazil for questions of freedom. Now we know that for black people all over the world. And so that the, question, the thing was, okay, how do we collect now, not just the oral history, but the actually popular musical forms that speak about slavery and that speak about colonialism. And that not just, not just a language, but also actually gives us a set of ideas about what the lives of people, of people were. The second part of the public humanities, and after that I will finish, is what, is what we call public engagement. And for this, we are very specific. We, we think very hard about, okay, what? How do we transform the curriculum in high schools? That's something that we have given a lot of a thought to. And so we have worked with uh, choices to produce a curriculum. And what I would say to you all is that the curriculum was produced in October of last year. By December of last year, we had 4,000 teachers across this country using that curriculum. We were able to find funding so that people could get the curriculum free for another year. So, but that curriculum was also important. How did we do it? We did not just put a group of scholars in the room and say, okay, write it. What we did was we got a group of students and said, tell us what you want to learn or what you don't know. Then we got a group of teachers because we're not high school teachers and said, tell us how you would do this. Then we got the scholars and said, listen, this is what they have said you write it. And then when we finished it, we went back to the students and teachers and said, okay, does this make sense? Or do we need to go back to the drawing board? It's a long process, but it is a process in which what we are being very careful with is listening and learning from everyday, from everyday people about how to make knowledge not to, uh, accessible, but also quite frankly, how to answer certain questions that we ourselves may not have. Because I would say to you that what is fascinating to me in all of these things as I go to them and listen keenly is, the, is that people put on the table questions that after years of study, I may have known or I may have just forgotten about and I, you know, I'm doing other things and I don't, but that the, the everyday people have a particular set of questions which they think we should try and answer. And that therefore, for us, a certain kind of scholarship, uh, what people call engaged scholarship, is really trying to think through um, making a difference uh, so that we can move the needle a bit. And this becomes really important because without that, I don't think we are will be able to do the kind of educated citizenry that is implicit in Trisha's remarks. Great. Uh, thank you. And, and, and again, we chatted the links of both of these centers uh, out at the beginning of this session. And I think what's so wonderful about both of these centers, uh, and I would hope uh, Brown in general, is a mission to connect the knowledge being generated to the great issues of our times and making sure that it's accessible uh, way beyond uh, uh, College Hill. So please uh, access these websites, look at the linkages, it's really open uh, uh, knowledge uh, to really make change. So now I'm gonna shift a little and talk about some of the sort of hot button issues of our days. Uh, Cause I know both of you have um, 
a lot to say about those. I'm going to start uh, with uh, Tony. There were several questions uh, that came in around reparations um, and how to think about re reparations. And so uh, from Jennifer, um, she asked, what kinds of reparations for our slave-holding past would you advocate? Yeah, okay. The, for us at the center, the question of reparations is an important one. But we like to think of, the quest, of the, that question um, in a much broader context. When people think about reparations, immediately they think about, okay, what are the financial compensations that need to be paid out? What we like to think about is the question of repair. What kind of historical repair does need in, in contemporary repair needs to happen, which may include financial compensation, but which, but which include all sorts of other things. And so therefore the question of reparations it, for us is not defined by monetary and financial considerations, but is defined by trying to find forms of, uh, of, pol of policy in which questions of equality are addressed, trying to form, trying to find questions of, of policy in which uh, access to education, to quality education is, 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 is addressed, trying to form, uh, trying to think about access uh, of quality healthcare, um, in, in, and, and trying to think about, quite frankly, questions of dignity. Um, uh, that, 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 that you know, in which uh, in a, in a society in which uh, uh, anti-black racism is is one of the orders that govern uh, that govern the society. We uh, in this year, you know, our 10th anniversary celebrations, we plan to in May, May 5th and 6th, actually have a full con two-day conference on this question of reparations to, to intervene in this debate to try and say to folks that the question of compensation is important, but that, if you, but, that the, but, you, but that the question of compensation cannot be seen separate and apart from the question of repair and the, some fundamental changes that need to happen in the society as well. And that if you become just focus on the question of compensation, then you miss a whole host of other structural things that racial slavery and economic inequalities have actually created um, and that one needs to pay uh, one needs to pay attention to that to that. So and so in my final answer to that is that we therefore don't we don't we don't say um, for reparations this is what you must do and this not what what this is not what you must do. For us I've said this openly in interviews from for from the center's position at we think that there needs to be a very hard conversation at Brown as to what does that mean? Um, and, how, and how in fact Brown can be involved in repair and reparative, reparative justice. Yeah, great, thank you. And Tricia, there, there's a series of questions around the kind of recent surge of, of, of racism. Uh, and, uh, and so I'm, uh, Richard, uh, class of 1966 asks, what is cost cause this recent surge uh, in racism? Mm -hmm. Well, um, a few things I think are, are, are important to identify. Um, one is that um, I'm not sure it's entirely a surge in racism, but a more, a more visible uh, expression of a particular kind of racism. And um, this has, I think, a lot to do with the fact that you know, Black Lives Matter, as well as any number of other racial justice organizations uh, have been working tirelessly to bring issues of significant systemic racism to the fore. And that coupled with journalism and scholarship and documentary film have created, uh, particularly at the end of the Obama era uh, and moving into uh, the Trump era, uh, a whole body of work that really had begun to successfully challenge the sort of a, the normalization of a kind of what I call a more liberal and quiet white supremacist a framework that assumes whiteness as the proper norm, uh, even when it does it gently and kindly, uh, and that challenges the validity of any kind of effort to, to unseat that hierarchy. 
And the success of these various movements, again, not just political movements in the streets, but, but journalism, scholarship, and, and, and film and art, um, have really provoked a profound response. Uh, and so there's, you know, uh, this notion of a kind of backlash is very common in every major historical moment where uh, racial justice movements, um, you know, make some traction and, and, and have some success. The other reasons I think are also about some other historical factors, just the highest level of significant economic inequality in the history of the world. And we are at the epicenter of that inequality. That means many white Americans are feeling that profound uh, economic oppression. And that, that, that normalization of, of economic hierarchy is being justified um, by claiming that it's black and brown people who are somehow creating this problem. Uh, so that I think is fomenting um, this concern. And the third thing that I think is playing a very big role is um, you know, the, um, the sense that the country is reaching a demographic tipping point and that whites will not be an easy majority um, in society forever in the United States. And that I think has also triggered this kind of, of response. Great. I want to just uh, stay with you, Tricia, because there's also been a whole cluster of questions around critical uh, race theory. Uh, okay. And um, Brian ask if you could comment on the current controversy of uh, surrounding critical race theory in public schools. Is it justified or, or just reactionary? I mean, it's, it's, it's not only, I mean, I wish I could get to the question of whether it was justified. The first thing is that it's not even happening. I mean, that's actually the most staggering, uh, you know, uh, reality of the situation. The vast majority of public school education you know, does a cursory examination of race periodically every once in a while. Now, some schools have added novels by, you know, say Toni Morrison, who was quoted as part of, you know, but was cited in this, what I call most recent hysteria, um, as somehow creating harm by educating, um, by having students read Beloved, right? That, that white students were being harmed by being confronted by, a text or two in a classroom that tells some version in a novel, you know, narrative novel form, the history of, of a certain kind of moment in slavery, a certain set of stories about enslavement. Um, so it's not a massive uh, educational enterprise, but the, the fear that students and that many white parents have that their students and their, their, their children would, would have to be transformed by an alternative construction of race is profoundly threatening to them. There is no you know, curricular movement in, in, in K through 12, but any kind of inclusion forces the conversation, right? That's on quite different terms. Any, any genuine form of inclusion intellectually uh, in the classroom forces a very different kind of understanding of self. And I think people are, are, are picking up on that and it's being manipulated profoundly, which is again, not the first time. Multiculturalism in college education in the eighties faced very much the same thing. Uh, and so this is a common tactic to, to, rat, to, to turn uh, efforts to create a multiracial, uh, more progressive uh, society turned, is turned into a kind of dangerous radicalism that's harming students. And I just want to remind our terrific alumni that, you know, there's no discussion about how the curriculum without an analysis of race and a historical confrontation with race harms not only white students, but black and brown students. Right. There's no, there's, there's only one student in this argument, and it's the it's the victimized white student in this in this imagination, and uh, that's a very powerful form of, of 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 changing the lens around who's being harmed, why, when, and how, and how do we benefit or not benefit from this. So we should take this very seriously. Ideas are at the core of every political trajectory, as as you know. You know, when Tony was mentioning the false binary between action and thinking, right? It's 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 abs not only is it false, it's that ideas are what drive protest or squelch protest or redefine protest and create norms and upset norms. It's it's it really is study is not study isn't is kind of a way to deal with ideas, but it's ideas that are incredibly important. Great. Thank you uh, for that. 
So given this moment, and I want to get back to um, Tony and, and the way you were sort of framing the whole reparations uh, discussion, uh, we have a series of questions asking, you know, so what can we do? What are the levers that we can uh, pull to address uh, these issues? And Martha uh, asks, what are the levers to expedite a shift to an anti-racist society when racism is so de deeply encoded in our laws, our policy, and our culture? Yeah, uh, that's a really great question. Um, and there's no, there's no real one magic key. And I know like people like to say, okay, what's the magic key that I can turn and, you know, and come out on the other side and things be different. Um, I think that there are, there are different things that need to, that, that can happen. Um, and that lay the ground for this, because in the end, um, the, 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 the transformation and, and, and real lasting change only comes with movements. It doesn't come and it doesn't come from any, from it, from anywhere. So that those movements are, you know, would be uh, faculty, students, ordinary people, everyday people, and so on and so forth, both in and out of universities. And, and so one of the things that I well, why I say to folks is that you one you one of the ways you might want to think about the start think about what levels you can pull is uh, how can you begin to understand what it is that we are facing and let me say why i think this is important we live in a, a moment in which the the truth is a slippery concept in which uh, you know there are alternative facts and that what happens is uh, um, you know, if you take the case of critical race, race theory as, as one example that Trisha does uh, outlined so well, is that you, you, people create fantasies based upon a, a set of uh, um, alternative facts that they present. And then suddenly these facts, these alternative facts and fantasies become material reality and the truth, and the truth itself. And so that in, I'm not sure that there's been a period like this in, in history. There, I mean, there's always been conspiracies and paranoia and, you know, kind of strange people saying strange things and so on and so forth. There's always been that. But to have it as mainstream, not on the fringe, to me means that you are at a, you are at a moment in which you are going to have, if you want to make change, you are going to have to spend time trying to puncture what is alternative facts, trying to, trying to find ways in which you can begin to get at what are the, the, the foundations of what are, of what, what are being said. Um, because if you don't, then what happens is that you actually just spin wheels. So it's not just to say, okay, let's have an anti-racist um, campaign and so on. Right. That you, are, you can't just think about it in that sense. You have to think about, okay, what are the things that are framing the questions of race. How does white supremacy take on a, a kind of added life of fantasy um, in, 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 in America? Why does it do that? Um, and, and makes money doing that, quite frankly. <laughs> right? So how, 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 do, how do you then begin to think about uh, a, a set of campaigns, a set of educational programs in which what happens is that you, you do what I call puncture these alternative facts? And so, and that is actually the most difficult thing I would want to argue, because because sometimes these alternative facts are fantasies. You cannot puncture a fantasy that you get because it, it has no it has no scientific foundation. It has no basis, um, and and so you have to build up a different kind of alternative narrative, a different kind of alternative story um, about this country, about the history of this country about the possibilities that then you can begin to talk, you can talk to people. Um, Trisha is right, ideas matter. Um, and sometimes, and even if the ideas are fantasies, they matter because it is what drives, it is what drives people. Yeah. Excellent, uh, thank you, uh, Tony. And, and, and we see this not just in um, the debates and issues around race and racism, we see it around democratic erosion, 
We see it around public health. We see it around climate uh, change. This has really become, again, an an endemic problem that I think we at Brown uh, need to sort of figure out what is our role to contribute to this alternative narrative that can maybe uh, crowd out these uh, these fantasies. Um, In our chat, we got a a great question from uh, Kristen, uh, and I'm gonna ask Tony to address this. And she asks, uh, is there a country that has advanced far enough towards a peaceful multiracial society that should be studied and maybe could be a model uh, for others? Um, I I pause for two reasons. One, um, I am very wary of models because, (laughs) because what you do is that you accumulate a set of typologies and and so on. And then you say, this is a particular model. And then something happens and you say, oh, this is the exception to it and so on. I'm a little wary of models um, as 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 a scholar. But I also don't, I cannot think of a particular, I'm also wary of models because a lot countries have historical specificities. And so that there's a set of the historical specificity to America that we need to grapple with. There's a historical specificity of the of United Kingdom, of France, of you know, of the Caribbean, uh, and so on. I mean, I've spent some time in the Caribbean in the last couple of weeks. There is a deep historical specificity in where people think about race and so on, that you you can't you can't map another set of models and another set of histories on, on top of it. So it is, so I, I can't, I, my answer to that is no. My answer to, the, to that question is, is, not, is not, is no, but also this, that you have to, in, if you have to spend time studying and grappling with and understanding the historical specificity of where you are. You, you, know, you, you only make change when you understand that in the concrete. And to understand that in the concrete means understanding the, the, the structures and the social forces that are array in a particular society. Mm-hmm. So I wouldn't ask people to go for markets. I say, spend time trying to understand where, where it is, what way you, where it is you are. Mm-hmm. Okay. So returning to then the United States, let me ask uh, Tricia. Uh, we have a question from Stephen who asks, uh, with dysfunction in Washington and states' rights, is it possible to gain traction in addressing centuries old racial inequities, uh, given the current moment that we're living in? Yeah, well, you know, if you're black or brown and poor, there's really not a good decade um, that you can go to. If you don't like this one, you know, it's not like there's a better one that's somewhere else. So I will say, you know, that's, that's a fundamental reality. But this is a new condition. Stephen is right. There's a particular climate that is, is going on. Here's what I think. I think that um, the what what recent uh, right wing organizers have been very effective at doing is mobilizing the local, and they're mobilizing the local by flooding uh, what were relatively neutral institutions with a, a very intense political uh, focus, and and that's basically they're just skirting right. They're using a kind of states rights logic, but they're they they've reduced from state down to local to county level and that's very powerful and i think we should think about what that what potential that holds for everybody that is to say you know uh, everyone has kids who goes to school everyone has kids who want to learn about different things so let's let's be as aggressive about uh, you know participating in the in these local institutions so that they don't become the voice of only one segment. And I'd say a relatively proportionately small but noisy segment. Um, but, but angry whites have shortened the life of success of, of many African-American social justice moments and movements. Let's look at Bo- Boston and busing. We look at you know educational integration, Brown versus Board of Education. You know, it still hasn't really been functional. So I mean, the the level of resistance and the power of that resistance uh, really shouldn't be underestimated. um, And we have to figure out how to respond to it. It can't just be, we're going to wait it out. There's no waiting this out. I think it's really important that we we take it seriously. 
you know, the federal government can do what it can do, but I don't think we can rely on it for everything. I think there are enough people of color around the country to also operate with a regional and states, you know, not states' rights, but a state-framed politics. Okay. So let me uh, continue on this line, uh, Tricia, uh, because there's a series of questions that have come in um, around, like, what can we do? You know, mm-hmm. given the moment, given what we're seeing in, yeah. the, in this kind of alternate fantasies narrative that Tony talked about, or even at the local county level, yeah. Pamela, um, the class of 91, asked, you know, what do you believe are the most important structural changes that we should be advocating for? And given the work that you've been doing these yeah. last couple of years on systemic racism and the different pieces, yeah. I wonder if you could address that. Yeah, well, ooh, that's a, one of those big questions I'm going to try to keep a, a small answer for. Um, so uh, the power of systemic racism is not so much where it finding its location, like, oh, is, is it in wealth? Is it in education? Is it in jobs and you know unemployment? Is it in criminal justice? Uh, so on and so forth. But it's about the power of the ways in which these areas are connected to one another and that discriminatory, problematic uh, forms of policy and practice reverberate across these areas to create something bigger and more difficult and painful than any one area could produce on its own. So criminal justice and its effects require for it to be as powerfully discriminatory and affecting as it is, it requires municipal complicitness, right, around fines and fees and and, uh, and misdemeanors and the use of, of economic terrorism and warfare on poor people to augment the criminalization, right? You have to have a certain kind of segregation to target communities, so on and so forth. So What's really important is is for us to understand that this is a systemic set of practices and that the most important thing we can do is look for those connections. And if we can separate those connections so that injustice and criminal justice isn't so easily tethered to public schools where we have school resource officers, you know, populating, you know, schools and arresting young people with, with violent you know, forms of arrest for, you know, incredibly marginal, limited disciplinary infractions. I'm not talking about people coming to school with weapons and and intending harm. I'm talking about typical teenage nonsense. So, you know, what you want to do is say, okay, we don't want the school to prison pipeline to exist because this can connect two forms of institutional discrimination in a powerful way. So that's the way I would encourage people to think about it. Now, if your question is, what can we do? Where can we go? I'd say wherever you want. (laughs) Honestly, there's really nowhere you could work on transportation. You can work on pollution and health discrepancies. You can work on, you know, unemployment. You can work on police profiling. You can work on education. I mean, I could be here for a whole hour listing places to work. It's going to be about wanting to separate places so that the power of that driving force can be reduced. Um, so that, that to me is the most important way to handle that problem. Great. Uh, thank you. That, that's really uh, terrific. I'm going to uh, turn to Tony. And Tony, earlier in your remarks, you talked about uh, Du Bois's, you know, fantastic book, Black Reconstruction. And we have a question from Amanda uh, that I think is related to that. And she asks, can you please talk about forms of present day labor exploitation that are likely part of the legacy of slavery? Farm workers, internationally contracted labor, slaughterhouse workers, factory workers in American territories, trafficked workers. Maybe talk about the le- how the legacy of slavery impacts all these other categories of workers. Yeah, that's a, that's a really, great qu- that's a really great question. I think that one of the things that we, need to think about is that are the ways in which enslaved labor became a form of labor in which uh, which then becomes, uh, 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 I'm gonna use a word I don't like, it becomes a model which people then actually try to implement right across the board in many places in the world, not just in America, but in many places in the world. And so that what you have is that if you, if the, at the heart of enslaved labor is not, um, because, you know, not just exploitation, 
but it's the business of a certain commodification of the person and a certain way in which that person is considered disposable. Then what you have in whether it's the farm worker, whether it is the um, whether it is the worker in 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 in, uh, in, uh, in certain kind of factories um, that that produce things in what is called just in time, particularly women workers um, that produce for the Nordstroms and for the Macy's and for the various department now Marcus um, in the various department Saks and the various department stores we have is that there's a certain dis understanding of disposability, a certain kind of way in which those workers cannot, should not be treated as human beings. And so that when you, go, when you look at the ways in which the, these workers are treated, one of the things that you will see is that for them to do, uh, for, um, for say a free zone or any other form of um, labor like that to exist, then the part of the, the requirements of, and the contracts that are signed by states and sometimes by countries is that these people, you cannot bring a trade union inside it. And you cannot organize trade unions. And trade unions are, in my view, the basic kind of body that, that, that protects, they're not radical bodies to overturn capitalism, but they are kind of basic, a basic uh, set of bodies uh, or organizations that will allow some basic rights. So that the, the, the ways in which these workers are treated, and particularly female workers, quite frankly, is that, is that they are treated in ways that are drawn from an understanding that late black labor was disposable and could be treated in a certain way. Um, and I think that the, to think about that, this question of, of labor and to think about disposable labor, to think about questions of exploitation of labor is something that is hidden in, 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 our, in, in, uh, in, in, in economic discourse and is hidden, quite frankly, in the ways we think about questions of race and class in, in, in this country. Um, and so one of the things to do to piggy, you know, just to piggyback on something about Tisha says, one of the things that I think is important in trying to make it possible for change, for some kind of changes, to think about how do you deal with the unorganized labor, particularly female labor, that are put in really onerous conditions of, of having to live and in deep exploitative conditions. So for me, you are, you know, I mean, there are students I know who have encouraged to become trade union organized, and a couple of them have. And that's because I, you know, they say, what do we do? And I like this, I think you do that. Because that doing being a trade union organizer is extremely important in a economic system where the where labor is not at all considered in any shape or form mm -hmm. as, as, as having any particular role to play. Yeah, if I could just say one thing to add to this, Rick, you know, sure. um, I think it's so important to realize that. Um, the mainstream public discourse, the space of ideas, you know, television, streaming, mainstream news, while, the, while occasionally these issues are covered, the, the deep and horrible uh, you know, dark side of capitalism, right, what it does to everyday workers is almost completely written off of the narrative of any public space whatsoever. There's no place to even hear or learn of these things unless you're doing kind of radical consumption of, of materials. And so there is a kind of, it's not just who owns the media, right? Which is a very narrow way of thinking about it. It's what stories and who's, who's dominating the narrative center of, of, our, of our mediated culture. And um, that's, I think, another place where people need to be very careful and active because it's not that what's being said there is perhaps untrue, it's what it's not saying that is so profoundly important. And, and this is where we see juvenile detention centers with 12 year old kids in you know, pants for a grown up, terrified in, in you know, incarcerated for ridiculous reasons, right? And we see obviously the labor exploitation that Tony's talking about, but you don't see it in, in enough. I, people did see it, things would change. That's why the George Floyd incident was so pivotal because while being black, you probably saw things like that in different places in those communities. You don't see that in the national imagination. That's why it's important for us to, to, to pay attention to the mediated spaces. 
Yeah, no, that's that's terrific. Um, there was a question that came out in the chat about um, sort of how you do your work. And what's so wonderful, and I think it's so wonderful about your work and so wonderfully evident in tonight's uh, conversation is how you make these incredible connections and bring to light things that are often obscured, et cetera. And so we had a question uh, from Elizabeth who wanted to know like, um, how do you collect your data? Um, how difficult it is to collect the data that to do the kind of research that you do? Uh, and is it possible for those data to be more publicly available and shared? Mm. So who wants to take that? Because I think that's a really wonderful question to mm. get more people engaged in this work. Mm -hmm. Tony, did you want me to go? Or, yeah, yeah you can go please. OK. Um, well, I mean, there's so many different kinds of data. Right. Um, so uh, certainly there's the traditional form of data, which is, you know, you can build spreadsheets, you can gather information and document it. And then you could spend a long time, as I've been doing with this systemic racism project, gathering a lot of this information. It's, it's quite overwhelming because there's a lot more. You'd think, oh, there's no evidence. There's just so much evidence. You're just like, this is obviously not about facts, which goes back to, you know, Tony's point about fictions and fantasies. But um, as a, as a student of African-American studies, um, it's uh, really important to remember that data itself is uh, a, a kind of organized empirical approach to information, to fact, to truth, to knowledge that is very specific and has its own troubled legacy in that it works to obscure uh, the, the ways data is being used to normalize the circumstances that are in front of us. And there's a lot of great books on race and methodology. The disciplines of knowledge come of age. They grow up under colonization and enslavement uh, and, and you, know, you know, patriarchy and all the other things we might want to list. So they, they come with them with methodological flaws. So one of the things when you say, how do you collect your data? Part of it is being super mindful about what's missing what has to be missing, right? You think it's really not until the 1970s that a movement like history from below, where you get workers' histories and labor histories and, and everyday people's history and incarcerated people's version of the police as opposed to the police record, which is pretty much what academic disciplines produced. So when you say, you know, how do I gather my data? It's, all, it's really about um, where you're listening, right? And, and what you think has to be missing based on you know, your sort of reading in a very broad way. So you, it's, it's sort of over, over years, you begin to see, well, these things keep being left out. Let's dig over there and look for connections that would otherwise be missing. Um, that, that's, that's my, that's, you know, I have a hundred answers to that question, but I'm going with that one tonight. <laughs> okay. Tony, how about you? Yeah, um, it's, I have a hundred answers as well. So I'm trying to think which is the best one. They, I think that they, it, for me, it is really about trying to find the spaces of erasure in archives and then trying to think through alternative archives to deal with those erasures. Um, and uh, so that we, it means that it, we, I, the, word, the phrase I've used for it is trying to find the archive of the ordinary, right? Um, which is the which is then what is it that everyday people do? Where do they do it? Um, and how can we begin to collect um, those the, the things that they do, the practices that they are engaged in, and then to theorize and write about those things. Um, and that's a different kind of practice because it means what Trisha says, listening, but it also means having a different gaze um, on, 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 on what it is that you are doing. And also quite frankly, recognizing that everything that you are doing is, um, there is that a way I, would, the way I put it to students is that 20 years time, I hope one of you will come and say, what the hell he was talking about? Um, you know, he, he didn't do this and he didn't do that. So that there is a way in which therefore what? That what even what I'm doing um, and, and, and positing a set of ideas, a set of ideas and 
asking people to look at certain things that there may be other sort of information. And I like to call it not data, but information and practices mm -hmm. that people are engaged in that I would not have looked at. And that a really great grad student may decide to look at and then turn over everything that, 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 that I was doing. And that's the way, in my view, the question of knowledge works. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it, is, it, is a, it is always expansive. It is always open to, to, uh, to, to different voices and to different set of archives that you need to, to, to pay attention. Mm -hmm. That's great. So I have two, uh, two last questions. There's a series of questions that came um, up about uh, Brown and, uh, you know, what are things like? How are things changed? Uh, asking about student attitudes, about uh, engagement on campus on these issues. And I wonder, since uh, both of you have been at Brown certainly longer than I have, uh, if you wanted to address uh, those questions. Hmm. Tony, why don't, why don't you go ahead first? Yeah, um, I, I usually begin by saying that the Brown student is a, a remarkable creature. Um, and I don't say that just because, you know, one is trying to, um, uh, whip up support for Brown. But the, 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 my experience both at the undergraduate and graduate level is that they are some remarkable um, students, um, that they are full of curiosity, that they are willing to, uh, to, to think differently. Um, if you, you know, when you, when you suggest certain things um, um, and that they, they are willing to, to be experimental in terms of trying to think about the world in which they world in which they inhabit and the world in which they will inhabit um, for the next 20, 30, um, uh, 40 years. And so certainly for the center, what we do is that we open the, the center for this kind of creativity so that we have, you know, undergraduate students will say, we think that the question of the castro state is important. And when you say, okay, you think it's important, you organize your reading groups and so on and so forth and the way you want to do it and you do what, and you, do what you think is, is necessary. Our graduate student says we need a space to begin to think about um, alternative forms of knowledge. And you say, okay, that's what you need to do, then that's fine, you know? And we don't, we don't organize it. We don't tell them this is what you need to do and so on. And so I think that what the, the way we, I like to think, we think of it at the center is the, how do you create uh, spaces that would allow um, creativity, that would allow the experimental quality of Brown um, that, uh, in terms of pedagogy and the way we think about knowledge and so on. How do you create a space for that, those kind of practices to be enhanced? Um, and I mean, and it's difficult because sometimes, quite frankly, some people make mistakes. But the way I like to look at it is that if you don't engage, you will not make any mistakes. And I certainly grew up making lots of mistakes, right? And therefore, I watch people making mistakes. And if they want to talk about it, we talk about it. Um, or sometimes you may talk to them quietly to say, you know, ABC, you know, you might want to think about it that way or that way. But the, the quest, the business of having the space to be able to do things and to, and, and, and to, think, uh, to think out of the box when necessary um, is, is, is what we try to do, particularly in relationship to grad or undergrad. Mm. Yeah. I'm going to emphasize the faculty because, you know, Tony and I, uh, I mean, I don't want to repeat half of what Tony said, except that Brown students are remarkable, uh, and that's entirely true. Um, and and, and uh, I was also a graduate student at Brown, uh, for those of you who may not know that, so I've been on both sides of that situation. What CSREA uh, aims to do is to create a critical and a challenging but embracing and supportive culture for scholars across the academic uh, sort of developmental hierarchy. So we have gr graduate student fellows, we have summer uh, undergraduate research uh, opportunities. We have a seminar that has graduate students, uh, a few of each of these categories, graduate students, postdoctoral fellows, uh, junior professors, associate and full professors who work together to share work in progress across the disciplines. And we do this also with artists and, and what we call our practitioners seminar. We bring in visiting professors from other places and we've had an amazingly successful 
uh, cultural climate that we've developed uh, where, um, where faculty feel that they can share work in progress safely and know that everyone in the room, while they have 10 different disciplines, are thinking through a question about race or race and ethnicity or you know Latinx identity or migration or homeland belonging right on, on racial terms. So even if they're doing a different say ethnic or racial group or a different set of issues or one's on gender and sexuality and the other isn't, there's so much synergy intellectually that it, it creates a, more developed careers, uh, creates better classes for, for students um, and it also allows us to create a research climate that allows us to recruit more diverse, incredibly brilliant faculty. So I, I think of CSREA as contributing to our success with the DAP insofar as we've been able to, to show recruit faculty, faculty we want to recruit that, that there's a space for scholarship when if you're in a small department and you might be the only one working on race, it's not just going to be you over there all alone having a conversation with three people. But in fact, the center will not only be bringing in speakers from elsewhere, but creating an intellectual community. Ideas happen in community. They look like you do them alone in some disciplines, but you're always in conversation. And you're always working with it with a body of, of ideas that are related to a group of people. So the more we can communicate, the better off we are. So that that's been a very important part of how of how we do what we do. That's great. Quick last question. Um, Rachel asks, what feels most inspiring to each of you personally at this moment? Ooh. I'm going to need a second for that one. <laughs> <laughs> Rachel, I don't know. Um, hmm. Um, I think I would say, Tony, did you have someone ready to go or do you want oh, me to? I'm, I'm thinking. Okay. All right. I'll, I'll stall for you, buddy. I'll stall. <laughs> um, I think what inspires me are, um, I mean, I guess it's always the same thing. I'm in the right profession because young people are pretty extraordinary. Now they're not all perfect. They're not all the same, but, um, you know, a, a, a hungry, intellectually hungry, critically engaged, thoughtful student, and whether they're at Brown or not, I guess, you know, they could be anywhere, uh, you know, is, is, is an amazing uh, sort of entity in the world because they have all of this information. They have a level of creativity that you just don't have anymore at 50 or 60 because you're already 30 years behind the curve on whatever the latest thing is. And they bring that to bear. Um, and so when I see that, not just in activism, but in challenges in do documentary film and in technology, uh, when I see that energy um, making a difference in the world, um, I I'm very inspired by that. I'm really inspired by that. Uh, I mean, I think that what really was insp inspirational is, and I can, you know, I'm thinking of, I think of a program that we run here in which we take um, kids from various high schools um, and do, do civil rights, uh, course on civil rights, and then we, we carry them to the south to look at um, civil rights monuments and meet various figures and so on. And to me, what the, the inspiration is to watch those kids come back to Brown um, and uh, do various things that were just that were not possible six months mm, ago. Right. So I'm so I'm I'm thinking here particularly of a group of kids, um, black and brown kids, who uh, took this course um, and then went to the south and then came back and formed a reading group on black literature without anybody then anybody asking them or telling them to do. And you know, leaving here one night at eight o'clock and seeing them and said, What are you all doing here? And they said, Oh, our prop, this is our reading group on black literature. And what are you reading? And they give a reading by themselves. And I just thought, you know, yeah, if you if, if, if Brown can can do that, right, then you know, that's the kind of you know, we all talk about making a difference. That's the kind of difference that we have. To talk right, right. Yeah. About. yeah. That's great. Well, we're coming to the end of our time, and I'm sure that I speak for everyone on this uh, on this uh, call to say that both of you uh, inspire me, inspire the rest of us, you and the work that you've done, and just this wonderful 
open conversation that we've had uh, this evening. I want to please uh, everyone uh, join me in thanking uh, both Professor Bogues and, uh, and Rose, uh, but also uh, to thank Mary Ward from Alumni Relations uh, and the advancement team that helped put this uh, together. This was just really, really a terrific uh, um, just a terrific evening of conversation and learning, et cetera. I want to thank everyone. I want to thank everyone for taking the time this evening uh, to be with us. I sincerely hope uh, that we'll be able to see one another in person on campus, maybe even for the May alumni uh, uh, reunion. Uh, let's hope that uh, the public health situation improves so that we can do that. Uh, and please stay tuned to other programs, as you can see. Uh, what we're trying to do is really bring the very best of Brown out to the alumni uh, and parent community uh, and to engage you around the most important issues of our time. So thank you, stay safe, and be well. Take care. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.